So welcome back to our faculty and student blog here at Pitt Law. This is episode three. I'm Shauna K. Spencer and I'm here with Professor Linda Tashbrook. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, good. And I hear you just released a new book. It is a brand new book titled Family Guide to Mental Illness and the Law. And it just came from the Oxford University Press warehouse on Monday, so I keep watching for it to arrive in the library. It right. hasn't come yet. It'll be hot off the presses when yes. it does, though. Yes, <laughs> it better be warm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what was a very common legal issue that you addressed in this book? Yeah, so since this is a book for families about dealing with mental illness and the law, right. that means that it is intended to be a guide for families to help loved ones who are managing a mental illness and, and sometimes legal issues come up. So one common thing that happens is that someone who has, say, an episodic mental illness will sometimes behave badly at work right. because they might be entering into an episode of depression, for example, that just makes them feel very blah and not want to do anything. Or maybe they have been experiencing anxiety and it hasn't quite reached the serious point where they can't work yet, so they're still able to go to work, but their anxiety is just causing them to um, handle everything in such a, a way that maybe they can't finish what they're supposed to finish because they're anxious about it. Um, so there are ways that mental health symptoms can make someone perform improperly you know, at work, right. improper conduct of some kind, maybe not getting along with others or just not getting their job tasks done. Happens all the time. What the law says about this is that in some circumstances, the person is supposed to be accommodated, and in other circumstances, the person deserves to be disciplined. And there's a whole spectrum of symptoms that people may have and job tasks right. that dictate which of these happens, whether it turns into discipline or accommodation. Families are the link that can help the employer to know what's going on and to assert that this is something that maybe would be better for accommodation or for discipline, but they can help to make the job situation as fair as possible for the person. Good, good. And um, what was an uncommon legal issue that was present in the book that you write about? Oh, well one thing that not a lot of people know about is that um, when you have to call the police, and, and that doesn't happen all the time right. when somebody has a mental illness, but, but there are occasions when you just have to call the police. Maybe the person is experiencing symptoms that are causing them to act out at home, or you're seeing a behavior that worries you. You can ask the police to send the Crisis Intervention Team, CIT, oh. and a lot of people don't know that such a team exists, but these are trained officers with knowledge about how various types of mental illness look okay. and how to talk to people who are perhaps delusional or experiencing other kinds of symptoms. They know how to do this the right way. Other police officers who do not have crisis intervention training may come in thinking, I'm in charge, I've got to get the scene under control. Right. And they might just upset everybody, not just the person that they've come to see, but everybody on scene, and they might just make the situation worse. And so families can ask for the crisis intervention team. And, and as I said, not only will that team know best how to interact with the situation, they're also good at de-escalating situations. Right. And the goal after de-escalating the situation is to direct the person who's experiencing these mental health symptoms into treatment and away from criminal punishment. Even if the person who called um, maybe wasn't even a family member, it was just somebody on scene, maybe at a coffee shop or any place in public, and said, we need police, here's what this person is doing. And if the dispatcher knows, oh, this sounds like a time to bring in the crisis intervention team, then the crisis intervention officer may be pressured by people on the scene, like, you should arrest him, he spilled my drink, or, you know, charge this person with assault because, you know, they right, flailed right. their hands out or something. <coughs> and, and the police officer may need to, like, settle everybody down and just say, we're going to handle this. Everybody's heard police officers <laughs> say things like that. I shouldn't be making fun of the police. But, 
but the police officer may just need to calm everybody on scene down and it may look to everybody like the police are arresting this person and hopefully the crisis intervention team will be able to let the person they're dealing with know you're not under arrest because they're more likely to be taking them to see a mental health treatment professional right right you know and get mental health treatment not get criminal punishment if there was a crime then it's possible that after the mental health treatment they would be charged but first treatment first is right. the priority yeah, yeah so i think that's something that's kind of uncommon right. that I've not a lot of people of had that. to deal with i didn't know that was an option that people could have and what was the what chapter did you enjoy writing the most? What was your favorite chapter in the book? Oh, you know, I actually liked all of them, but one that surprised me that I enjoyed was bankruptcy. Who would like <laughs> anything about bankruptcy? <laughs> but um, it occurred to me as I worked on that, that the, the bankruptcy system is very similar to criminal system in that, um, it has all these very rigid rules, and someone who declares bankruptcy is kind of under the control of the system for a number for an extended period of years, and um, and it's kind of predictable. And so I set up that parallel at the very beginning of the chapter, and then because bankruptcy law is so rigid, it also made it really easy to write because. Um, there are just these rules and there are just these practices and you have this many days and then you have this kind of hearing and here's what will happen at that hearing. And, and that enabled me openings to insert within this structure thoughts about how families can help to arrange the communications. Like these are always very quick hearings and it's got to cover these things. But their family member can say, yeah, but my person is going to be upset by the speed, so can we go last in the day? Can we just work that out with the clerk so that they don't have to be there for all those hurried hearings in front? Right. We'll just come at the last 10 minutes. And they, they can even suggest changes to the way the seats are set up so that you know maybe they don't have to look at an intimidating judge. They could be facing another direction. And so I was able to um, come up with a lot of ideas to work with that I thought would be really feasible in the bankruptcy chapter because the structure was so very clear. Wow, who would have thought that bankruptcy would be that exciting? It is fun. I think the whole book is very interesting. Good. I hope that people will read it. And tonight's the night, Thursday, December 6th at 6 o'clock. I hope that people will come to hear me launch the book at yes. Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. This is at the Carnegie Library Lecture Hall right here in Oakland. Good. That's exciting. I hope a lot of people are there. Well, thank you for tuning in with us for the third episode of the Pitt Law Faculty and Student Blog. And thank you, Professor Tashbo. Thank you for having me, Shauna Kay.